The Royal Committee has once again succeeded in bringing to our campus an interesting and provocative speaker in Dr. Eric Gutstein. When I heard that he had titled tonight's lecture, Why Did Darian Albert Die? Using critical math to understand the conditions of our lives, I was certain that this would be a different kind of discussion. For those of you who may not know or remember, Darian Albert was a 16-year-old honor student in Chicago who was killed during a fight on his way home from school that September. His death focused a spotlight on the Chicago public school system and sparked a national debate about the issues that our students face every day in schools across our country. Dr. Gutstein's focus on social justice brings a new and important perspective to these issues, and I know that all of you in the audience this evening, and I hope there are many of our education students here, will gain much from this dialogue. So, Dr. Gutstein, welcome, and thank you for being here. My thanks as well to Dr. Dennis Patanichek, Dean of the Seidel School of Education and Professional Studies, and Dr. Gwen Beagle, Chair of the Ryle Committee. So at this time, I would like to call forward Dr. Patanichek, Dean of the Seidel School. Good evening. On behalf of the Seidel School of Education and Professional Studies, I want to add my welcome to the Spring 2010 Royal Lecture. This lecture is named for Pauline Ryle. Who is this Pauline Ryle, we may say? Pauline Ryle was the longtime principal and teacher at the Salisbury University Campus School. A substantial request in Ms. Ryle's will provides for a continuing lecture series at Salisbury University. Outstanding national figures in education come to SU twice a year to speak to Salisbury University students, faculty, and community members. Ms. Ryle's gift, Ms. Ryle's gift was especially important in that it was one of the first substantial gifts to SU in the market beginning of private giving to Salisbury University. Ms. Ryle's gift was facilitated and came to fruition in large part because of the efforts of Dr. Morris Bosman, who was Education Department Chair at the time. We are so pleased that Mrs. Bosman could be with us this evening and we salute her. <laughs> Ms. Pauline Rao is the consummate educator, teacher, and principal, who was a no-nonsense lady who ran a tight ship all for the good of the children who attended the campus school in the building that is now the Purdue School of Business in Corobus Hall. Her gift has benefited thousands of teacher candidates who heard Ryan lecturers over the year. We have some special guests in the audience, and I'll just name a couple. Dr. Diane Allen Provost, Mrs. Lynn Seidel, benefactor of the Seidel School, as well as many colleagues from the Maryland State Department of Education, as well as from our local school. When I look at the list of previous Ryle lecturers, it reads like a who's who of American education. The names on that list are familiar to anyone who is a student of education in America. Maxine Green, Cornell West, Jonathan Kozel, Elliot Eisen, Nell Nottis, Linda Darling Hammond, Sonia Nieto, Alfie Cohn, Herb Cole, Ernest Boyer, Aaron Gruel, James Comer, Terrence Robert, David Pearson. We are proud to add Rico Gutstein to that list. Special thanks to the Royal Election Committee, chaired by Dr. Gwen Beagle. I present Dr. Beagle to you now. Um, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the committee um, 
that brings about the Ryle Lecture every year. And the Ryle Lecture Committee is, if you would stand up and be recognized, uh, Dr. Ray Bond. Just first tell you just a little bit more about myself. Um, I'm going to try to talk about my analysis for why I think and why others think the Darien and Alberts have died and who they are. I'm going to talk a little bit about Chicago and try and put these deaths in some kind of context. I'm going to try and explain what I mean by critical mathematics and use different words to describe some of the same ideas. I'm going to talk about a Chicago public high school, which we call SOJO for short, and its critical math program. And I'm going to use both student voice and some video clips. And I'm going to try to explain, as in the title of my talk, the relationship between 
questioning about Darian Albert's death and what does critical mathematics to study the conditions of our lives, what is the interrelationship of these things. And so I should start with a little bit more about me and then, oh, if this becomes pink, you all let me know because we had trouble with the hookup here, the video hookup, so just yell out code pink or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. we, we gotta make sure about that. Old technology here. It's, it's the University of Illinois computer, and, you know, we don't have much in the way of money, so the computer goes, that's why. So you heard a little bit about me. Um, I do want to say that I'm a product of the 1960s and 70s. If you saw that screensaver up there, I was laughing when I came in here and saw that. That's my old neighborhood, Harlem, where I grew up. I grew up on the edge of Harlem. I was shaped by social movements of that day. And so this talk comes to you from that spirit, so please hear it in that way. I also want to say that, in some sense, not much is new. Um, we always build on what others have done before us, and this talk is very much in that spirit. And if you notice, there was a long list of acknowledgments in the title slide. Uh, that's because this is truly collective and collaborative work. So there's a theme that runs through my work. Uh, it's a theme that runs through the work that we do at Sojo. And it's embodied in this, well, Paulo Freire would call this a codification. If you can't read what it says, it says, no oppressive order could allow the oppressed to begin to question why. And so this question of why, why did the Darian Alberts di die, uh, reverberates through this talk and through our work. And it is this process of beginning to question and trying to understand the real reasons for the conditions of our lives that motivates this talk. And my argument here is that an oppressive order, that is the powers that be, do not want people who are on the bottom raising these questions because it becomes very dangerous. So I'm going to share with you a little bit of Chicago. These are two young poets, spoken word poets, uh, and they, I have a video clip, and I will tell you that this is a powerful short clip. That poem was actually the one that meant the most to the entire team because Chicago still has a very horrible epidemic of kids killing kids. Raphael Johnson, 17, Baker High School, died November 9th, 2006. Brandon Cohen, Will they ever call your death beautiful? Your life a sacrifice? The meaning of blood and bullet ever be called romantic? A love story to be jealous of? Christian Chris, I remember you in Guatemala and green matching your flag on your Independence Day. Your hair was a black puff of curl and countenance. In homeroom, you always had homies in the hallway waiting for you. We're still waiting. I couldn't sleep for a week when you washed up water logged in the Calumet River, puffed and purple like violets before bloom. Eduardo Pena. Eddie. You were the first to say hi to me first day of school when I stepped in with bugle boy jeans and a hot top fade and I saw you. Possibly the coolest dude to ever grace elementary. September 22nd, 2006, eighth period. We really need to hang out. Yeah, that'd be cool. I'll see you later, dude. September 22nd, 2006, 8.30 p.m., maybe a little later than I thought, when your path ended on Vincent's road, run down by bad luck and a police officer. Lives like these shouldn't be shortened. Sentence fragments of a future. And in the 14 days it took us to write this, we've had to add more names to this list. Because in this city, before we blossom, we must weather storms unforecast because every intersection can become Virginia Tech. So excuse me if the news be missing my emotions. See, being brown in bigger time as a town makes you endangered. And in the past two years, I've seen over 60 native sons set in the graves. I guess this is the part where poets produce plans and we don't have any. In Chicago, anyone under age 20 is a target. And I don't know how to do more than be afraid that an age allowing me to be on this stage might have me murdered by my Monday. I'm 18. I play pickup basketball games with ghosts. Is there a reason I'm making it out of a community that is murdered young men I might be mistaken for? I Christian Lamont. Don't. No. Would they ever 
call you that beautiful. Your life a sacrifice. A love story to the genocide. How many deaths will it take before this is considered genocide? The man will be in the same time. The man will be in the same time. So that gives you a little sense of the reality that we deal with in Chicago. So the question of why all these young people are dying in Chicago is something that we need to consistently raise. So let me try and address this by telling you a little bit more about the story of Darian Albert. What you're looking at is a Chicago public housing development called All Guild Gardens, which is on the very, very farthest south side of Chicago. They built All Guild Gardens during World War II for returning black vets so that they could work, and they could live in an area near the steel mills and the auto plants in the south side of Chicago, industrial area. All Guild Gardens was built on a filled-in marsh, and in that marsh was where the Pullman rail car factory dumped their industrial waste. So they dumped the waste, they filled in the marsh, they, they built all Gelb Gardens on top of it, and when white GIs returning from World War II got the GI Bill and the opportunity to get into the suburbs and become more middle class and more stable, black GIs got all Gelb Gardens built on top of a toxic dump. It's one of the most toxic the polluted places in the United States. Chicago Public Schools closed the neighborhood school in this community in 2007 and sent the students five miles away and two bus rides to Fenger High School, where Darian Albert attended. That was in 2007. Now you have to understand that Chicago has a history of turf issues it's a very turf-oriented town. When people come to another neighborhood, they're often not welcome. These are two black uh, working class and low-income communities, Balkel Gardens and Roseland, where Fenger High School is. In 2009, Chicago Public Schools did something that they call Turned Around Fenger High School, which is now Duncan's national, part of Duncan's national education plan. Mind you, Duncan was in Chicago at the time. A turnaround is where they keep the students in the building and they fire every single adult, the teachers, the administrators, the counselors, the music people, but in addition, the security guards, the custodial staff, the lunchroom women, as if they contributed somehow to the so-called low performance. And when they do that, they allow people to apply back for their jobs, at least the teachers. And nine of the hundred teachers in Fanger High School managed to come back. It was at the start of 2009. So that means that the veteran black teachers who knew the community, who had taught the aunties and uncles, the mothers and fathers, the brothers and sisters, who knew things that might jump off on the playground, who could be out there outside of school diffusing tensions, were not there. So here you have a situation where you have one student coming from a school five miles away, a community five miles away, where they had lost their own public school, and two, you have this turnaround situation. No one is saying that the Chicago public schools system caused Darian Albert's death, but we are definitely saying that the policies contributed to the, to the culture of, of violence that existed in that building. So when we ask the question, why did the Darian Alberts die, we have to look at this issue of the contributing factors of the social system. What part do they add into that? And so when I pose that question there, I've been different people historically who have tried to address this question. One of them, Franz Fanon, was a psychiatrist from the Caribbean, Martinique, who went to Algeria during the War of Independence of Algeria against their French colonial masters. He treated both torture victims, Algerian torture victims, and as well French torturers 
and he wrote quite a bit about violence. And he tried to understand the violence that oppressed people enacted among themselves. And he wrote, while the settler or the policeman has the right the live long day to strike the native, to insult him, and to make him crawl to them, you will see the native reaching for his knife at the slightest hostile, aggressive glance cast on him by another native. And this is what people refer to as lateral violence. When you feel the oppression and the pain, and rather than being able to know how to deal with it or look to the root causes, you strike out laterally at the people in your community, on your block, your family, the people who you love and who love you. And Fanon was not the only person who made this point. This young man, Patrick Kamenyan, was a teacher at Crenshaw High School, which is a big comprehensive high school in South Central LA. He uses an analysis based on Fanon and he has a sign in his classroom, or he had when he was teaching there. He renegotiated the Crenshaw School mission. And he has this sign that says, if you feeling gangsta, bang on the system. Cam's interpretation of what that means is that if you feel the pain from this system, rather than take it out on your sisters and brothers, figure out what's the root cause of it and work to change the system. And another person has also taken this idea K. Wayne Yang, who taught in East Oakland at a public school there, a similar type of school, and he has a way of thinking about the anger that students bring in with them when they're living under colonial or oppressive situations. And he's figured out a way to renegotiate that. And the language that he uses to express that term, that idea is, my students don't resist me because we're too busy resisting the system together. Now these teachers and others are doing this type of work and they're basing a lot of what they do on the work of Paulo Freire who talked about what must an education look like if you want to do this type of work. And Freire said that the starting point for liberatory education must be the present existential concrete situation reflecting the aspirations of the people. That is, start with people's real life experiences don't stop there, but move out from there into a deeper understanding of society. So now I'm going to segue and talk about the Greater Lawndale Little Village School for Social Justice, a mouthful, which is why we call it Sojo for short. This is a mural in the front of the school. Sojo uh, was opened in 2005, and it was born out of struggle. It's in a Mexican immigrant community, Little Village, in Chicago, that was promised a new school. The Chicago board reneged on the promise. People dogged the mayor. Eventually, they went on an 18-day hunger strike in 2001. They got off the hunger strike, 14 people, and they won their school. It's a brand new building, $68 million building, four small schools in the building. One of them is the Social Justice High School. The campus and the school are 70% Latino, 30% African American, 95% low income. The two communities are Little Village, La Villita, and North Lawndale. Little Village is the Mexican immigrant community, North Lawndale is the African American community. Yes, separated by railroad tracks, a viaduct. This is a neighborhood high school. That means youth can walk to the school or take a bus if you live in North Lawndale. If you're in the attendance boundary, anybody can come. It's not Selective enrollment, gifted and talented, magnet, nothing like that. And our mean ACT score in 2009 was 16.8, which is, I know you do SATs out here, I don't quite know where it comes to, but this is just a little bit better than the Chicago average as a whole. It's a normal neighborhood Chicago public high school. Um, I was a design team member, which means that I worked on the plan to get the school started from 2003 to 2005, and I've been working with the school since it opened. It's now in its fifth year. This is a march of students from Little Village to North Lawndale when there were racial tensions in the community. It wasn't safe for black students to leave the building after school because of the tensions, uh, racial tensions in Chicago between the two communities. As you see that the march is multiracial, it's about four or five hundred students. This was in the second year of the school. Gives you a little flavor of the type of things that we do. And this is a picture 
at the first extremely large immigration rights march in 2006, May Day in Chicago, 600, 700,000 people. These were freshies at the time, we only had one year. These young women have since graduated. Just gives you a little feel for the school. The mathematics program, and now I'm going to say we're talking about critical math as I get to it, has what we call reform math. And this is conceptually based mathematics, not plug and chug or drill and kill, but mathematics where you really kind of get the opportunity to understand the mathematical ideas. That's mainly what the teachers do at Sojo, but we also intersperse critical math. And I'm going to get to the definition of critical math and let the students define it a little bit later on. This is a long-term project, as I mentioned, five plus years. The type of work that we're doing, I think we can call it collaborative, participatory action research. Uh, I started working with that initial class in 2005, and I stayed with them as 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th graders. They graduated in June. Like I said, we're now in year five. In grades 9 through 11, that class mainly did this reform math program with this critical math projects stuck in a little bit at a time, and I'll again talk a little more about that. But in grade 12, for that freshie class, that graduated in 2009, there was one math for social justice class that was last school year, which I taught, had 21 students. There was also been a group of student co-researchers, who we call the crew, that from their 10th grade year through until the time they graduated, that was about altogether maybe 13 or 14 youth over the years who did exactly what I'm doing right now. We went around the country, we talked about our work, they taught adults some of the social justice math projects we had done, they became advocates for critical mathematics. This is the crew, our last uh, crew as seniors in our lunchroom. You can see them. And this is our Math for Social Justice class. I don't know if you can see those t-shirts. They say danger, educated black man, black woman, Latina, Latino. And uh, that's our school uniform, mandatory. Now that's a joke. <laughs> I tricked them into giving me their t-shirt sizes and I had them made for us. So, and that's the truth. So that's our class missing a couple of people. Okay, so critical mathematics, or to use different language, reading and writing the world with mathematics, has three components. Reading the world with mathematics, which at a top level means to use mathematics to understand deeply the genesis of social inequality. Writing the world, and you can make a pun to make it right, or writing in the sense of changing the world based on your understanding. And the third component is reading the word, but in this case, the mathematical word. These ideas all come from Paulo Freire. And the idea of reading the mathematical word is, of course, for students to have access to college, if they want to be an engineer, a mathematician, whatever, uh, and to be financially self-sufficient for themselves, their families, and community. But it also means so that you can read and write the world with mathematics, that you have sufficient mathematical sophistication and understanding so that you can actually use that to make sense of social reality. So rather than me talk too much about this, I'm going to go into letting our students tell you. So this is George, one of our crew members. These are people's real names. This is five of them. He's been all over talking for it, so talking about critical math, it's okay to use his name. There was a crew session, and I, there was about four of them sitting around, and I said, do me a favor, write on a piece of paper. What does reading and writing the world with mathematics mean to you, and why do you do it? Right. So impromptu, this is what for George, and then I'm going to come back to other people, and you'll see them through this talk, what they wrote. Reading and writing the world with mathematics means a lot. It means that you look at any issue happening anywhere in the world. When you read the world, you are getting background information and seeing why whatever problem you see is occurring. You then find a way to resolve it. This then brings in writing the world with mathematics. When writing the world, you are ready to use mathematics to prove your point. Also, Every point you have will not be a solution. It will sometimes just be a way for you to bring light to a situation that no one knows about. So to me, this is what reading and writing the world with mathematics means. We do this for a reason. There are big corporations trying to take advantage of people. 
and there are also plain old injustices that happen every day. We do this to educate ourselves on global or local problems that can be solved with mathematics. We also do this to learn more advanced mathematics. Lastly, we do this so that we can take our knowledge back to our friends and families to educate them. Once we educate the ones that are closest to us, we then go out and educate our community on how to prevent things from happening to them and how to catch things before they are taken advantage of. Impromptu, we just sat and wrote this down. Better than my words, let him talk. So in this class, the Math for Social Justice class, we based what we studied, the context, on what Pablo Freire called the generative themes, which are key social contradictions in people's lives and how they understand, experience, and relate to them. So the first one was the 2004 presidential elections and the 2008, which I'll talk more about. The second was on displacement, that is, gentrification, deportation, foreclosures, predatory subprime loans and mortgages. The third was spread of HIV AIDS, criminalization of youth of color and people of color, and finally, sexism. Each of these topics either was proposed by me to the students, and I met with them three times when they were juniors in the spring of their junior year to discuss these ideas and what we would study as seniors, or they came directly from them. And we agreed beforehand, whatever, before we even started class in the fall of 2008, we all knew what we would be studying. The mathematics content, quantitative is kind of an eclectic blend. This was 12th grade, we had some flexibility. Quantitative reasoning, quantitative literacy, algebra, discrete mathematics, probability and statistics, and pre-calculus. And I want to say that although I kind of begged, borrowed, and stole curriculum and trying to develop this and worked with nine graduate students, uh, in the spring before school started, I had to develop the curriculum as we went on every day. So this unit um, was the 2004 presidential election stolen and the 2008. So it was a unit that did probability and statistics. In particular, we studied binomial and normal distributions and confidence intervals. It was really kind of like an AP stats unit. It was about a 10-week unit. Um, we were looking for evidence of things not happening by chance. A man by the name of Stephen Freeman wrote a book called Was the 2004 Presidential Election Stolen? And we used his book as kind of a, the impetus because he used mathematical analyses, probability and stats, to make his arguments. We looked at something called poll differences, which I'll explain in a minute, and deviations from the mean. And students wrote an op-ed piece on Huffington Post that was published October 31st. You can Google it, it's still on there where they tried to warn people about what we had learned from the 2004 presidential election in preparation for the 2008 election. And as I said, this was a 10-week unit. Now, mind you, I had students who were 18 or, or who were turning 18. This was Obama. This was Chicago. This was kind of a no-brainer. People were totally engaged in this. So we had a little math here. What do we mean by poll difference? First, you have to understand that an exit poll after you vote, you leave that polling booth, there's these people who are doing the exit polls, and every 13th person or 9th person or whatever, they've developed a statistical methodology over 40 years. They're pretty good at this. They ask you, excuse me, sir, uh, would you be willing to, or ma'am, you know, say who you voted for confidentially and stick it in a box. And they record it, you know, mid-aged white woman, um, time of day, where they do it, and they try and make it so it's statistical sampling around the state. And they get pretty good if they have too many women or whatever, they adjust for it to match the demographics of the state. So they've gotten very accurate with exit polls. In fact, they have been used internationally to verify the truth of elections. So here we go with math. In Ohio, 2004, Kerry's exit poll said that he won 52%. Remember, exit polls are released before the recorded vote. Okay, the exit polls come out first. So this poll said he won 52. His recorded vote was 49%. That's a poll difference of 3%. And we say against Kerry, because the exit poll said he got 52, the real vote was 49, okay? If his exit poll projected that he would have gotten 47 and he got 49, then we say the poll difference is 2%, but for him. People with me on that? 
Okay, poll difference, right? There's no a priori reason for a poll difference to favor one candidate or the other. It's essentially a random occurrence. You expect the poll difference to be slightly off, but due to statistical variation, sample variation, you don't expect a right off. And over 50 states' exit polls should split how? Roughly half and half, right? That's what it should be under normal conditions. Okay, so this is, again, George. Uh, teaching us about this. Uh, this is in our class, and you will see the numbers. Poll difference favored one of the candidates. And the question we're asking is, what is the probability that you would get this happening when you have events that are 0 0.5, 0 0.5? Now, so let's not be sloppy with the language to say how many states favor Bush. That's not what we're talking about. Is there any question about the distinction I am trying to make here? Lawyer? Tony? Maya? Chips? George teaches. Guys, we will get it 50 percent. The number says 44 percent. The number of states that came to Bush are older. And we, in 52, 44, are going to have a sequence of the for those 44 states that came to Bush out of the And then you have to multiply that by the chance of Bush getting, the actual probability of Bush getting the football, 44 out of 50, which is 25. And that's the way it's a chance of getting 44. The four of four represent the total amount that was made. And the same thing with the five and the six represent the remaining states that favor carrying the four of them. After you move on, I'll let you get your answer. One point forty two, you might say. This just tells you the probability of getting four of four out of four of them favor of four but the D minus A means that the negative A means you have to take the decimal point back eight times. Well, these you actually be seven zeros, which tells you that there really was kind of impossible for all of to get 44 out of 50 favorites. There's almost no probability that this poll differences could have split 44 to 6. So Channing was another student who eventually joined the crew. Didn't want to do the crew at first. He said, what made me change was that we need more commitment from youth. You've got to be part of the problem or part of the solution. I'd rather be part of the solution. Youth are important. You always hear people saying youth are the future. And if we speak up, people will listen. So if we don't do nothing, nothing can be changed. So we're going to hear Channing and read his words, if I can do all my stuff right here. This is Channing reading a draft op-ed piece. I mentioned earlier we wrote an op-ed piece on the Huffington Post. So we'll hear Channing here. So I'm going to ask Channing to read this piece. Uh, his piece is too mathematical for the op ed piece. Okay? That's Chan. But um, uh, I think now that you know, this was, remember we were supposed to do the draft op ed piece? Mm -hmm. So you did it for homework the other day. Everybody, uh, so you missed the class, but this was his piece, so I just want to use it as an example for us. Look, if we actually stole up his language, I stole You. You. Yeah. We have been working to prove that something went wrong in the 2004 presidential election. We have used statistics, facts, and formulas to prove that the results of the election did not have the right hand. 
There are three main points that we've been working on that up with. The 10 zero closure split of 10 battleground states, the 44 6 closure split of 50 states, and Kerry's 0.52 proportion on the 2004 Ohio Energy Report. A poll difference is the difference between the recorded vote and the exit poll. There are really 11 battleground states on the team that oppose this. With this situation, we can call it a binary, final situation because we are dealing with only two outcomes. Saying this, to get the probability of a 10 0 split, we use the binomial, binomial flow formula, uh, where P is the probability of the flow difference favoring Bush or Kerry, K is the number of flow difference that favor Bush or Kerry, and E is the total number of flow difference. In this case, P is 0.5 because there's a 50 50 chance of a whole Just so you know, you're really in the school.
So in the previous years, just to give you a flavor of some of the little short projects we've done while the other teachers have been teaching IMP, we did one on racial profiling, the mathematics of that. We mathematized Hurricane Katrina and asked the question, if New Orleans was one-third white, then why were all the people who were left behind in the Superdome black? We looked at the race and class issues of who got left behind. We looked at how world map projections, different ones, can affect our sense of ourselves in different parts of the world. We looked at the boundaries, the school boundaries between the two communities, because in the first year of school, a reactionary Latino politician in the area wanted to throw out all the black students and make it all Latino. And one of the math teachers said, got to do this project. So the key question for the project was, what is a fair solution for both communities? And we drew out the mathematics of that. We did projects on where does the money go, cost of war as opposed to cost of human needs. We looked at the exploitation of workers in third world sneakers factories and talked about the shoes on young people's feet. And we asked about the Gina Six, who were uh, six young people, uh, black high school students in Gina, Louisiana, a few years ago, who were charged in the beating up of a white student after some white students, we presume, hung some three nooses in a tree down in Gina at their school. And the first person who went to trial, the first of the Gina Six, uh, his jury was all white, and so we looked at the probability of in Gina, Louisiana, given the demographics, that his juror would be all white if it were truly randomly chosen. So those are just some of the other critical mathematics projects, or reading and writing the world of mathematics projects that we were involved in. So what are we learning here, or I should say relearning? One, that students can co-construct a social justice classroom. And by that, what I mean by a dialectical process is that I may have initiated certain things, but this is impossible to impose on youth. If you have ever worked with youth, you know you cannot go into a classroom and decide it's going to be all your way. This is a negotiated, collaborative process, especially if you want to do this type of a classroom. We had what we called our seven C's that became kind of linchpins of the work. Um, yes, I know questions started with a C, but that's how we did it. So the idea of connecting two things, that's bringing it back to Paulo Freire, of the, the starting point of liberatory education should be people's lives so that they can connect. The issue of questioning, critiquing, and challenging the ideas. Collaboration was built into what we did so that we would communicate and create a new world. Those were, that we had a poster in the back that had those on the wall. Um, that myself as a teacher was also a student learning from students and the students were also teachers teaching me and each other. This comes from Paulo Freire again. And then students listen and take responsibility for others in a, such a context. And here's a little video clip of our students. Um, this is our math class, people standing at the board. Now, quick context here is we were looking at the issue of, this is during the displacement unit, and the issue of affordability. We looked at the uh, increase in house prices in North Lawndale over time and looking at lines and best fit to predict what was going to happen in this community. And it became clear to me students didn't understand what a line was. So we were doing some work in terms of understanding lines and graphing. This is just a short clip, but notice how students um, take responsibility for others' learning, etc. Okay, so you're saying that the, the equation for this line is Y equals negative 7? Amy Silencio. I didn't say anything. Oh, I thought I heard you say that. That was my That was my name said that. Why did you say that? Sorry, Amy. <laughs> What'd you say? I don't know what to say. Okay, you talk to Eddie, but why is it X, Y is Y? Which is it? So? Is that a clear explanation? So, what's the x coordinate here? And we don't know what the y coordinate is. 
Joanne Moore, what's the X coordinate here? That might be the, the X coordinate. So how do we measure the X coordinates, people? How do we measure the X coordinate, Joy? How do we measure the X coordinate? How do we find the X coordinate of a point? Okay, so, so the way we measure the X coordinate is we look at the X axis, right? You're asking for the X coordinate? Well, the equation of the line. Wait, 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 one conversation here. Jeff, Jeff has a question. So that's just an example of how the class, the students were able to build this type of collaborative relationship. And what else are we learning? That students are learning themselves to deeply question and are beginning to ask why. This is a student interviewing another student. was stolen. 
Was it fair or was it stolen? We are trying to find out if the election was stolen or was it a lucky break for Bush? Why has this election had a huge difference in that? Whole difference? Why? That is the question we want to answer. I cannot explain to you what really happened in the 2004 presidential election, but I can give hard evidence that shows it was tampered with. And that's the truth. So what else are we learning? Students can read and write the world with math. We see this through their op-ed piece, through the community presentations. They can also learn mathematics, and I hope I've given you a little bit of sense of some of the mathematics that they've learned. And they also change how they understand mathematics, their communities, and themselves, which is in a sense a no-brainer. If you have students in these type of experiences, how could they not have their understandings of the world shaped? So here we're going to hear Maria giving a uh, reading from her essay on the displacement project. And... <coughs> the math I learned from the mortgage project was a dynamic system for looking at the changes of what we owe. I also learned how to find the amount that is due to interest in the amount paid to the I would craft a dynamical equation and subtract my ending balance from how much I paid. For example, if I had a monthly payment of $1,000 and multiplied by the time I had paid, for example, five years to equal 60 months, then I would multiply 1,000 times 60, which is $60,000. Then I would grab my different sufficient, which would give me my balance at the start of 161. Then I would say I had a mortgage of $160,000, and my balance at the start of 161 is $145,000. So what I will do is subtract $160,000 minus $145,000, which would equal $15,000 were paid on the principal, and $45,000 went to the interest. This is just some of the math I learned. I also learned that the house prices in our community are extremely high for a, for a medium family income. Most people can't afford these mortgages, which might lead people to look for housing to in a different manner. This is one way gentrification happens. This is what I learned about the world. What I would like the people in my community to know is that there are different types of loans. I would also like to tell them to read what, these, what they are signing, including the fine print. If they don't understand it, they should get help. I would like them to learn and teach them about how the little mortgages work, the fixed rate, 30 year mortgage, and the negative amortization. I think that in my community was, most, was more well informed they wouldn't get it into unfavorable mortgages. I would like to show them the, di the different paid amounts and different types of loans. Then compare and show them, and then compare and show them how much they save or how much more they would pay. Some connections that I see between the, these two parts of the unit are that in both communities, people are being forced out their homes. Of course, it's different situations with similar classes. African Americans are being forced out their homes because they can't pay their homes. The taxes go up so much that they can afford to keep living in those communities, so they are forced to look for another place to live. For Mexican, for Mexican people, the problem is that they don't have jobs in Mexico because corn isn't being sold. Because it's cheaper to import subsidized used corn than to grow their own. That forces Mexicans to leave their family and homes to come to the U.S. to look for a job. This is how the union connects. They face similar situations with different classes. We saw in the video so many similarities. People are being forced out of their community through gentrification. Latinos, especially Mexicans, are being forced out of their country by not having a good paying job. Also, the house mortgages don't only affect one community, but both. They are some, sometimes a target of bad loans that will only make banks richer. I want people in my community to know that we are, we are really similar to these situations. That there is more that makes us similar, less that makes us different. If we want to fight to bring your people out there, the best way is to unite. Fighting each other is not going to take us anywhere. I think this is something very important our community should know. Well, I just would like to say that I really enjoyed this unit. I learned a lot about not only mathematics, but about the world and my community. I really enjoy combining social justice issues and mathematics. And I just want to <coughs> highlight 
by this. <coughs> There's more that makes us similar, less that makes us different. If we want to fight the bigger people out there, the best way is to unite. Fighting each other is not going to take us anywhere. I think this is something very important our community should know, and I want to relate this back to the issue of Latin violence and why I draw the dairy now would stop. So lastly, as I end up here, uh, we're also learning that students grow and change. Ruth, one of our crew members, thought that social justice math was stupid in ninth and 10th grade, but the Gina 6 project impacted her in a powerful way because she knew that racism existed from police brutality, et cetera, in her, in her neighborhood, but what was so new to her is that people were concerned about something in Gina, Louisiana, which is 1,500 miles away from Chicago. They had no personal connection, but they were taking a stand against racism. 50,000 people came out to a rally to support the first of the Gina 6 on the sentencing day. So this was very new to her. So she was able to bring together a political analysis and a mathematical analysis. Remember the question was, what's the probability that Michael Bell, the first person convicted, would have had a whole jury given the demographics? And this is Ruth talking at a crew presentation where they were teaching Bell. Ruth is on your right. That I was on your left um, as they were talking about this, and someone had asked them some questions about what they had learned. Social justice math was stupid to becoming an advocate and a crew member. We're also learning that developing critical math curriculum is very difficult. One in which students learn to read and write the world of mathematics while also learning to read the mathematical word. To develop that type of curriculum is difficult work. Developing good math curriculum in general is hard, but this is a one step even more complex in the sense of integrating it with uh, rich mathematics, I'm sorry, with reading and writing the world, so that's a real challenge. Um, this is not just using in and sticking in critical math projects once in a while. This is kind of a whole different conceptualization. So this is an open question that we have to learn how to do as we go. So our advice to anyone trying to do this, start small. That's in terms of developing it. We're also learning that teaching critical math curriculum is hard as well. Because we know that teachers need content knowledge, in this case mathematics, and pedagogical knowledge, how to teach. That's been known, but we also realize now that teachers themselves need deep knowledge of the political context, which is not really part of the teacher education literature in terms of what teachers need to know to be able to do this type of work. There's a uh, term that mathematics is not a spectator sport, and I would reframe that and say critical mathematics is not a spectator sport, we have to learn by doing, by collaborating, by studying the process. And of course, to work with students, not against. And I want to recall you, K. Wayne Wang, K. Wayne Yang's quote, my students don't resist me because we are too busy resisting the system together. And again, the advice here is start small. So implications for our current situation today, this is a teachable moment. I was talking to, um, your university president over dinner, and we were talking about Congress is paralyzed, our economy is paralyzed. This particular point in history is a very dangerous point with tremendous opportunity because people are looking for different ways of doing things and different answers. The current road that we are on, whether it's sustainability and the end of our planet down the line, we don't know where this is going, we have to be active in terms of thinking about our futures now. And this, if we don't seize this moment right now, 
we're doing our planet and ourselves and our grandchildren a disservice. Youth and social movements have always been key to change in this world, and we have to really acknowledge and value that. The TINA thesis, T-I-N-A, there is no alternative. Let us bury that, because there are plenty of alternatives, and this type of work of using mathematics or using education to read and write or rewrite the world is being practiced in the United States, in schools, and around the planet as well. We need a deep analysis of our current situation to really understand the complexity and the depths of the crisis that we're in. We need some kind of vision of where we're going and what a new world would look like. We have to have some kind of program and platform to think about how concretely we move forward. And we need appropriate organizational forms in terms of how do we get there. Those are all some of the things that at least strike me as a very essential to the development of our future. Finally, if more youth knew who their real enemy was, they wouldn't be killing each other. And using critical mathematics to understand the conditions of our lives can play a role. I conclude with the rock of our crew, Beto, who has done probably 14 or 15 different presentations. Beto is on your left in a focus group discussion with the crew that I had to take a quarter as we were going, she started talking about her neighborhood. And she said, I've learned to question how and why. Mr. Rico told me that I was just giving people the mathematical answers. I went from questioning things in math to questioning things in life. Now I question everything and everyone. I asked her why. Because we're taking regular math and implementing it. We use our knowledge to address other issues that affect others, people of color, low-income people, etc. The reason why some people act so aggressive is not because that's how we are, but because that's how we are meant to be because of what's happening to us. So like all the police and stuff, all these North Lawndale shootings, Little Village shootings, another shooting, another kid dead, or something like that, it's just that that was led by something else. It's just not, people don't just pop out with a gun and start shooting. It's because something is going on that is leading people to do certain things. It's not a way of excusing it, but it's a way of addressing the question, why? No oppressive order could allow the oppressed to begin to question why. Thank you very much.